Yep. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So I'll, I'll start. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present. I'll talk a little bit about what's happened so far with COVID and then uh, give some thoughts about what might be going to happen next. Although with COVID, it's proved very difficult to have precise forecasts about what's going to happen. We've seen very recently what happened in Singapore, uh, quite suddenly actually, that case numbers suddenly got larger and larger and larger. And that's a worrying uh, scenario for, for places like Hong Kong or Taiwan where, and, and Macau, where transmission has been quite, quite well suppressed so far. So m for myself, I'm a, an epidemiologist. That means I work on uh, epidemics. I work on information available at the population level on infections and infectious diseases and how we can best control those infections and stop them from spreading in the population. I'm not a medical doctor. I have a PhD in statistics and I've been working in epidemiology for the past 15 years in Hong Kong. I was first involved with COVID back in late January of, uh, of this year, when we were aware of the cluster of cases in China, in Wuhan, and then case numbers began to increase. On the 22nd of January, my colleagues and I were invited to go to Beijing to start a collaboration with uh, China CDC, who we've worked with many times in previous years, and we worked together with them to do a very rapid analysis of the situation in Wuhan, which was published in an article in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, one of the figures is shown here on the slide. And what we looked at was how fast case numbers were rising. And we can see on the left hand side of this figure, the numbers start quite small, but then grow over time. And then the reason for a decay on the right hand side of the figure on this slide is not because the epidemic was controlled in January, it's because many people who'd had symptom onset after the 8th or 9th or 10th of January hadn't yet gone to see the doctor, hadn't been tested. So there's a lot of the epidemic curve that would still later be filled in as time went on. So at this point in time, we focused our attention on the left side of the epidemic curve, which was relatively complete at that point and looked at how fast case numbers were growing, particularly cases that were not linked to the Huanan seafood market where it's presumed perhaps there was a zoonotic event in October or November, which slowly led to spread in the community as well. And then it was eventually picked up because there were still some cases being linked with that market, even later in December and in January. One of the key findings from that early study which we completed and published uh, towards the end of January was the epidemic was growing and it was doubling in size every 7.4 days. And so that at that time in December and January, and when we did this analysis on the 24th, 25th of January, the numbers were still very small. But what we've seen now is that the numbers are still increasing week on week. We've seen recently it was a million cases worldwide and then 10 days later it was 2 million cases worldwide and it won't be long before we have 4 million, 8 million, I guess. Numbers just get bigger and bigger and bigger once there's exponential growth at play and it's very difficult to slow things down. We estimated here the basic reproductive number of 2.2, meaning that we estimate each case of infection infected on average 2.2 more before any control measures were implemented. That's a higher reproductive number than influenza means that COVID is a little bit more difficult to control than influenza, but it's not nearly as high as something like measles, which is extremely contagious. So the SARS-CoV-2 virus is contagious, it spreads easily in a place like Wuhan, and it's difficult to control, but it's not extremely contagious. And indeed in Hong Kong, we've seen if a person infects others, it's typically one or two or three other people. It's quite unusual for one infected person to infect lots of other people. It has happened, but it's very unusual. Uh, Professor Gabriel Lung, the Dean of the Faculty of Medicine here at Hong Kong U, wrote uh, an article explaining how the team here, himself, myself, and Joseph Wu, uh, started the Infectious Disease Epidemiology Research Program almost after SARS, I think in 2004, so 16 years ago. And we've built it up gradually and we're now in the right place to respond to emerging infections uh, because of support via the Food and Health Bureau in Hong Kong and, and also support from Hong Kong University over the years. And that's been really critical in allowing us to have a timely response to understand what's going on in China initially and then in Hong Kong.
I mentioned the reproductive number of 2.2 with growth doubling about every week. The numbers in that epidemic curve look quite small. It was just a handful of cases at the beginning. But over time, case numbers that double every week will get larger and larger and larger. And that's one of the properties of exponential growth that's it's quite shocking sometimes when I remember in the media, there was a report of a million cases a few weeks ago, and then only 10 days later, it, it was 2 million cases. That was doubling after 10 days. And I think 4 million cases, 8 million cases, 16 million cases will be, will be happening in due course because there's this inexorable growth of infections and it's not easy to slow down exponential growth once it gets going. So in Hong Kong, we've really focused on stopping an epidemic from even beginning so although we talk about epidemic waves in Hong Kong, in some sense, we haven't really had a local epidemic. We've had about a thousand cases, but the majority of those have been people infected outside of Hong Kong. And locally, there's been some outbreaks, but no real community epidemic so far. I want to make one point before I jump into what's been happening in Hong Kong and what might happen next. And that's that we have to be very careful about the distinction between confirmed cases and infections. We know there are always going to be more infections than cases. In Hong Kong, we have a thousand odd cases. Most likely there are some more infections that were not picked up. Not many though in Hong Kong, maybe up to a hundred or I don't know, not a lot more that we haven't picked up, a few hundred at most. If we compare that with somewhere like the United Kingdom, where laboratory testing is very much focused on severe cases that need to go to hospital, mild cases are not tested, people are not tested if their contacts are known cases, they're not tested if they arrive in the UK from, from abroad. We know that the case numbers in the UK will not be so close to the numbers of infections. There could be many more infections in the UK than there are confirmed cases. And that also means we need to be very careful in comparing fatality rates among confirmed cases. Our fatality rate in Hong Kong is four, four deaths out of a thousand cases. In the UK, it would be a much higher ratio of the confirmed cases would be fatal because they really don't test a lot of mild cases. So in order to, for someone to be a confirmed case, if they're infected, they need to go through a number of steps. They need to get symptoms, need to go to a doctor, need to get tested by that doctor, and then the test result needs to come back positive. And each of those steps can be like a filter. So some people who are infected won't get any symptoms. It's a small proportion, but it does happen. Among people who get symptoms, some will be so mild they don't go to the doctor. Among those who go to the doctor, not every doctor will have the test available. Uh, in other countries, at least in Hong Kong, we do have very good availability of testing now. And we know that the test isn't always positive. We've heard about a few cases where someone will, be, will have COVID, they test it, but the test comes out negative, and then a day or two later, they're tested and it comes out positive. Maybe their viral load is a bit low, and the test isn't always 100% perfect. It can miss people sometimes if the viral load is lower or if the sample isn't collected in the, the, exactly the right way. Of course, in Hong Kong, we also have quarantine of people and we're testing people at arrival at the airport. So we will pick up some people who are asymptomatic because we're testing them automatically. We're not waiting for them to have symptoms or to go to a doctor, but elsewhere, there's often these steps which act as filters. One of the studies that we did quite, uh, quite recently was a study of the case definitions in China and how they've evolved over time and broadened as there's an increased, there was an increased understanding of the characteristics of cases, the symptom profiles, the severity profiles. And so by late, uh, sorry, by halfway through in mid-February, there was an expansion in the case definitions to allow for mild cases uh, to be captured and each of these expansions in the case definition meant that a wider pool of infected people could be captured as confirmed cases. And when we applied this to what we knew about the epidemic in Wuhan, we have a revised estimate of how many cases, hypothetically, there could have been if testing had been available at a much earlier date, which it was not, and if a broader case definition had been used at an earlier date, which it was not. I think in the early stage of this outbreak, it, the, the perception was that most infections were severe. We now recognize there's many mild infections. So we estimated in China as a whole, if there'd been much more testing available at an early stage, which of course was not possible, but if it had hypothetically speaking, and if the case definition had been broader from the beginning, then there could have been maybe 230,000 cases detected. There would have been more infections than that because some infections still wouldn't meet the case criteria 
uh, that were being used. For example, asymptomatic cases were not included. And so there would be more infections than that in China, but certainly not a large number of infections in China. I recently saw a preprint estimating how many people had been infected in Wuhan, estimating it was up to 10% of the population. That would be up to a million people in Wuhan. And it might be an overestimate because the test that they used could have had some false positive results. But that would make sense that it wasn't really a very, very large number of people infected uh, in the first wave. And outside of Wuhan, outside of Hubei province, the numbers of infections were really very low. Outside of China, we've seen many countries could follow a very similar trajectory. This is a graphic from the Financial Times uh, from a month ago. Many countries following a trajectory with doubling about every three days and finding it difficult to slow down transmission, although now there's been some success of the lockdowns uh, in the past few weeks. We can see Hong Kong and Singapore down in the bottom right doing much better in suppressing transmission. I want to explain a, a couple of concepts that are used when we come to uh, responding to an emerging infection. If we were to experience an emerging infection like Ebola, which is extremely serious and we would not like it to be able to spread, we'll go for a strategy called containment or suppression, where we might be able to accept some sporadic infections, but we do not want them to spread. We don't want outbreaks and we certainly don't want a community epidemic. So under containment measures for very serious infections, we'll aim to keep incidents at a low level by very aggressively looking for cases, isolating them once we find them. And if the disease has the characteristic that transmission occurs quite early, then contact tracing is going to be critical and quarantine is going to be critical. And I'll come back to that a little bit later in my talk. And we may also have some community measures as well to slow down any transmission that escapes our testing, our net for looking for actual cases. It's difficult to sustain those kind of measures for a long time, but these are the kind of measures that are used in Africa to deal with Ebola, because there's no, uh, no, no, no country would like a, an outbreak of a very severe infection to be able to spread. On the other side of this table, we have mitigation, which is the kind of strategies that would be used for pandemic influenza. And in mitigation strategies, we understand that an epidemic may be very difficult to stop, but we may be able to slow it down to buy time, to spread out infections over a longer period, to reduce the surge and the requirements for healthcare. And so the measures we use for mitigation are mainly the community measures, non-specific, just separate people, uh, make, make less opportunities for transmission to occur, maybe close schools, ask people to work at home, uh, stop mass gatherings and so on. We won't do the case finding if we're in a mitigation mode because there'll be too many cases, we wouldn't be able to test everybody. We won't be able to do isolation of everybody. We won't be able to do contact tracing and quarantine of all the contacts. There'll be too many at that point. So in the early stage of COVID, I think quite a number of countries were thinking about whether to go for containment or whether to go for mitigation. And some countries started thinking about mitigation and that meant a quite a different package of measures would be used. And the concept of mitigation is shown in this slide. So if we have an outbreak that occurs, an epidemic that occurs uh, in green, and we would like to slow it down and spread out the numbers, we'll do these mitigation measures, these social distancing measures, and aim for maybe the blue curve instead. So we'll delay it, we'll reduce the surge, we'll spread the cases out. We might still have incidents of infections that exceeds our health system capacity. We, we might have more people that require hospitalization than we have hospital beds. We might have more people that need intensive care unit admission than we have intensive care unit beds, but we'll be able to cope by having some surge capacity by freeing up beds with uh, a canceling or postponing elective surgeries, making more space available and so on, and somehow be able to cope at least with a flattened peak. But concerns were raised when Imperial College London released a report indicating their estimates of what might happen shown on this slide. And according to the Imperial College London estimates, the impact of even a mitigated epidemic of COVID-19 would be very considerable. There would be a substantial excess, particularly in requirements for intensive care beds beyond the existing capacity, even if it was somehow expanded with some surge capacity, there would still be a very substantial excess in terms of need for intensive care and then substantial mortality. And for 
those of us in Hong Kong with a population of 7 million people, we acted very quickly and we've kept transmission to a low, uh, to a very low level. We have four deaths. I'd like to draw the comparison sometimes with New York City, where actions were taken a little bit later after community transmission had been established. And with a population of 10 million, I think in New York City, they now have about 10,000 deaths from COVID. And still there will be probably more, unfortunately, in the coming days and weeks. And so Hong Kong could have found itself in a similar situation. And for reference, a severe flu season would cause about a thousand deaths in Hong Kong. Uh, and so, you know, COVID-19 can really cause a very substantial health impact if it's allowed to spread and if an epidemic is allowed to build up. The estimates used by Imperial College London of severity are very similar to our own estimates of how severe infections might be. In this particular study led by my colleague Joe Wu, we estimated that the symptomatic case fatality risk was 1.4%. What that means is we estimate for people who are infected and who develop symptoms, their risk of mortality would be 1.4%. That's very much higher than something like influenza. And there's considerable variability by age shown in the left-hand side, where it's really the older adults and also not shown here, but we also recognize people with underlying medical conditions are really very vulnerable. So in a place like Hong Kong, if an epidemic was allowed to develop and then there was spread into elderly homes and, and more vulnerable communities in Hong Kong, more vulnerable sectors of the community, it could really be very, uh, very harmful to, to those people's health particularly. In younger adults, it's often a very mild infection, but in older adults and people with underlying health conditions, it, it can really be a serious infection, um, often requiring hospitalization. So the situation in Hong Kong, we now have over a thousand cases, but the majority of those are imported. So they are people infected overseas and then traveling to Hong Kong or returning back to Hong Kong from overseas. Uh, in this slide, we've highlighted all of the different public health measures that have been used over the past three months to combat COVID-19. The first row of public health measures are the travel-based measures where initially we had travel restrictions and reductions to China and then South Korea and some other areas that were affected. And then since later in March, we've barred the entry of non-Hong Kong residents from outside of China uh, to come to Hong Kong. And these travel measures have recently been successful in reducing to a low level the numbers of infected people who come back into Hong Kong. We know that most of those have not spread infection into the community, but maybe a small number have, and that's been the seeds or the triggers for community spread and community outbreaks. So those travel measures are going to be particularly important going forwards in time to stop infections from getting back into the local community now that we've managed to uh, it seems like we've managed to eliminate infections locally and we're only having sporadic infections coming in from overseas. The second categories of measures are those case-based measures, so doing a lot of testing, isolating the cases in hospital, tracing their contacts and then quarantining their contacts and also testing now everybody who comes back into the airport or if they cross the border back from mainland China, we test them if they've been to Hubei province in the past 14 days. And for the community measures, there are school holidays, special work arrangements for civil servants, and many other businesses, private businesses followed the same arrangements of uh, uh, arranging people to work from home, canceling mass gatherings, sporting events, closing theme parks, and some other measures more recently uh, since late March in restaurants and bars and, and leisure facilities. And I think all of these measures have had a contribution one of the things we're trying to do here in Hong Kong U is to estimate what's really the contribution of each of these different measures. But it's difficult because many of the measures are implemented at the same time and they're overlapping. And so it's not easy to distinguish which of them are the most important. And in addition to the measures implemented by the government, there's also voluntary changes in behavior by the public in Hong Kong. For example, wearing face masks. In SARS, we did some surveys where we estimated about 70 to 80% of people wore masks in public. In H1N1 in 2009, the flu pandemic, it was only about 10%. And then now for COVID-19, we're up to 99% in the past two months of people wearing masks in the community. And I think that's particularly uh, an important measure and an important voluntary change in behavior by, by people locally. 
I should acknowledge that face masks are really a critical supply for healthcare workers and we need to prioritize surgical masks for them. We can also wear cloth masks and we're trying to figure out the best design for cloth masks because some designs are certainly going to be better than others. I think that universal wearing of masks in Hong Kong has contributed to effective submission, suppression of transmission. And I think it's particularly important that we're wearing masks in public transport and in crowded areas. One of the most effective measures for COVID-19 is contact tracing, where we get ahead of the virus. And it's difficult to do contact tracing. So if I was to ask you about your family members, you can tell me. If I was to ask you who you had lunch with, you can tell me. Ask you, if I was to ask you, who did you sit next to in your office, you can tell me. But if I ask you, who did you sit next to on the bus when you went to work this morning? Who did you sit next to on the train? Or who did you stand next to on the MTR? It may, you maybe wouldn't know. And so by preventing transmission in those kind of uh, locations where lots of people mix and don't know each other, that's a place where we wouldn't be able to do contact tracing. And so using masks to prevent transmission is really, really helpful. And one of the particular difficulties with COVID-19 is it does seem like people can be infectious before symptoms appear. So one of our studies that was recently published, we looked at how infectiousness might vary over time when we came up with the estimates shown here. The people seem to be most infectious around the time that their symptoms begin. I would say the curve on the left looks very, uh, very precise, but is certainly not a precise estimate. You have to blur a little bit in your mind, but for sure, people are most infectious around the time their symptoms appear and relatively less infectious as time goes on. And what that means is there can be a lot of transmission among people who are infected and then just around the time their symptoms appear. In Hong Kong, this is a figure showing the timing and the delays in isolating cases. So each one of these red dots is a case. And if there's more than one red dot in the same place, then it's darker, meaning there's two or three cases with that combination. And what we see in January and then February, the delays in terms of when someone had symptoms and then when they got tested, confirmed and isolated. The delays were often 10 days or more. But into March, we've managed to bring that delay down to about five days, maybe five or six days on average. But that's still a delay. And if I just go back, if we delay isolation until five or six days after illness onset, we've most likely missed the opportunity to stop transmission from occurring from that person who's sick and who's identified as a case. And what we need to therefore do is get one step ahead of the virus, find out for the cases we've just identified, who might they have already infected, that's contact tracing, and then put those contacts into quarantine so that if indeed they have been infected, probably there's a low chance, but if they have, then we stop any further transmission and we get one step ahead of the virus. So that's why contact tracing and quarantine are really so important, and they really have been important in Hong Kong. We also know that the non-specific measures, like school closures, like working at home, uh, like cancelling mass gatherings, and like everybody wearing masks, all of those measures have had an effect on influenza transmission. So obviously, testing, isolation, contact tracing wouldn't have an effect on flu, but the, the community measures have they reduce flu transmission by 44%. And that's much more than the effect we've seen in previous years when schools have been closed, where there was maybe a 15% reduction in transmission. And I think the additional going from 15% to 44% shows the impact of all of these other community measures, the working at home, canceling mass gatherings, everybody wearing masks, everybody improving their hygiene. And that's really important. We've been tracking transmissibility of COVID-19 over time in Hong Kong, and we've been relaying our estimates on a dashboard from the School of Public Health, and the Center for Health Protection also used these estimates in their dashboard. We've stopped estimating the reproductive number just very recently because now we are down to zero local cases for a while, and there's no way to estimate transmissibility when there's zeros, when there's no cases. Uh, but we can say that there's very low transmissibility because there's no cases locally. But what we can't say is what's the precise estimate. And it doesn't really make sense to estimate the reproductive number today when there's been no local cases recently. So we've paused estimation for, for a while and we put a little footnote here to just say we paused it and we'll restart again monitoring this reproductive number 
if the if a second wave were to begin in Hong Kong. And just to, to explain what the numbers mean, I said at the beginning of my talk in Wuhan, we estimated the reproductive number in Wuhan was 2.2. In Hong Kong, we might expect even a little bit higher than that if we did nothing, if we allow COVID to calm and spread in the community because Hong Kong is even more densely populated than Wuhan. But because of the effective public health measures, we were able to keep the reproductive number down to around one for three months. Basically, since the end of January, the reproductive number has been at or around one. There's obviously some variation and a little bit of that is noise. Seemed like it went above one a little bit and that's when we were having a spike in cases later in March. But generally speaking, it's been at one or about one for three months. And that's good news for us because it means as long as the numbers stay low, they will stay low. As long as we just have a small numbers of infections in Hong Kong, there won't be potential for spread. Uh, if we were having a reproductive number above one, that would mean that there will be a slow and steady growth in cases over time. So we wanna keep the reproductive number below one with public health measures. So getting close to the end now, when will it go away? I don't think it will go away. In Hong Kong, we've managed to keep it out. Some other countries will also be able to keep it out. Australia and New Zealand are aiming for that. Um, but other parts of the world will not be able to keep COVID-19 out. They will not be able to stop the spread. And so because of international travel, there will always be opportunities for the virus to come back into Hong Kong and come back into other places that have not yet experienced epidemics. There may be some environmental uh, variability in transmission. We've seen countries in the tropics being relatively less affected so far, but we can look at Singapore and see there's still a lot of opportunity for transmission in Singapore when it's hot and humid. So there may be some role of environment, but I don't think the summer is gonna stop the spread. It may just slow it down in the Northern hemisphere, but in the Southern hemisphere, they have to fight against maybe the enhanced transmission or improved transmission when the weather's a little bit colder. There's certainly the risk of a second epidemic wave in China, but we've seen the health authorities in China jump very quickly on the outbreak in Harbin with relatively small numbers of cases and already doing lockdowns in that city. So that signals the intention in China really to prevent second epidemic waves from occurring, even if it requires lockdowns again. I think they will they, those will be used even more proactively than they were used in Wuhan to stop any kind of second epidemic away from building up in China. When will everything be over? Two possibilities. If we can get an effective antiviral treatment, that would make us much less concerned about people getting severe disease. If we could have a drug that can treat people who are still having mild infection and stop the infection from getting more severe. We haven't yet figured out which antiviral drugs are most effective. A lot of trials are ongoing. And then the big hope is for a vaccine, but that may take 12 to 18 months. We can hope we might get something sooner, but I think a realistic estimate is 12 to 18 months. And we don't have a lot of experience with coronavirus vaccines to rely on. So whereas with influenza, we know how to make those vaccines and we can get a new vaccine within six months. For coronavirus, we're starting from a much, uh, a much more limited knowledge base about what the best kind of techniques would be for vaccines, what the, the most likely strategies would be to succeed. And so there's a lot of work that needs to be done. That's not gonna be done very quickly. What's next for Hong Kong? We'll certainly have to continue many of the suppression measures we're using. We would expect to have imported cases coming in again and again in the coming weeks and months. There will be opportunities for local infections and outbreaks to occur. That's for sure. And so what we need to be ready for is surges in cases and particularly local outbreaks and get on top of them as quickly as possible so that they don't overwhelm our capacity for isolation, contact tracing, and quarantine. And so we don't find ourselves in the position of Singapore having to do a lockdown for a month because I think the measures that we've used in the past three months have been much more sustainable. Most likely we can relax some of the community measures for now because the numbers of infections are low, but we would need to be nimble, need to be ready to bring them back into play if outbreaks were to be detected in Hong Kong and the border control measures are gonna be critical, uh, particularly border control measures for travelers coming from areas that are heavily affected, but we may be able to consider relaxing border measures to places that are free of COVID like Macau, 
maybe other parts uh, of China, maybe Australia, New Zealand in the coming months, we'll see. But I think we'll need to keep a very close eye on the risk of importation of infections because we saw in March having even handfuls of imported infections uh, per day, tens of imported infections per day could really pose a big challenge to stay on top of. Um, so what do we need to do next? So my, my own team are working on identifying what are the most important components of the suppression uh, in Hong Kong. Can school closures be relaxed? Can children go back to school? We think children may not be the most important uh, group for spreading COVID. And we know children may be able to get infected, but, but don't seem to get severe illness if they do get infected. But we're worried about whether they could still be able to spread infection in the community. And that would be a problem in Hong Kong. Um, and we're also thinking about any ways that we can identify imported infections sooner. But maybe that's a, that's a more uh, detailed discussion with people who work on biomarkers and so on. Because we know that we can detect the virus with a technique called PCR, but that misses people who are crossing the border without shedding virus. And we need to follow them up later to pick up if they do start virus shedding. But I wonder if there's a way we can pick up people who are infected even earlier with some other biomarker. Um, so I'll finish now and uh, uh, note that the work I presented is not only from myself, it's from colleagues well, Professor Gable Lung, who's the Dean of the Faculty of Medicine here, and Joe Wu on the right of this figure, uh, and many others actually here in the School of Public Health. So I'm ready for questions. Shibani. Great. Thank you so much, Professor Carling. Um, that was, was really, really uh, detailed and interesting. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for all the really important work that you've been doing uh, on um, the, the, the COVID-19 outbreak. Um, lots of questions coming in, but I'm just going to start off by asking uh, a couple. So you mentioned, uh, and I know you did a recent paper on, on the case definitions uh, in China and how uh, they were actually broadened uh, sort of midway through to encapsulate a uh, bigger number of, of infections. Um, what do you think the, 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 the implications of that, uh, the implications of, your, of, of, of the research um, that, that you presented are? I mean, do you think that the global response would have been any different if, if the cases were seen to be you know, much, much, much bigger than the numbers that we heard uh, sort of in yeah. January. Well, I think we recognized even late in January from the exported cases that there was a mismatch between the severity of infections reported in Wuhan, where all the cases had pneumonia and seemed to be quite seriously ill, versus the earliest exported cases in Thailand and then Japan and then other places, which were all mild. And I remember the very first exported case was a lady from Wuhan who'd been to see her doctor and the doctor said she was fine to travel with a fever. So she went to Thailand. And that really alerted us that there were most likely a lot more infections in Wuhan than confirmed cases. And in Wuhan, they also recognized that and broadened the case definition. We all remember the stories about how they built a hospital in seven days at the end of January in Wuhan. At the same time, they built a new laboratory from scratch to test 10,000 samples a day and that meant that when they expanded the case definition in early February, they had the laboratory testing capacity to cope. Because obviously, it, it's no good if you have a case definition that allows for mild cases, if you don't have the lab testing capacity to match. And I think in other countries around the world, what we've seen is that they didn't have the lab testing capacity. In the US, for example, they were really testing very few people in, in the month of February. They were not generally testing people with mild symptoms and they were focusing on people coming from China when actually they should have been looking at potentially people infected in other parts of the world and even domestically. Mm -hmm. And um, my second question, which I think is something that is sort of on everyone's mind right now, uh, I know it's still early days and you're still, uh, you and your team are still doing some research on, on this, but mm -hmm. when you talk about relaxing, potentially relaxing some of the social distancing measures and, and some of the mitigation measures that we have in place here in Hong Kong, um, what, what, what sort of comes to mind first uh, in terms of measures that you think, you know, haven't, haven't really helped that much or, or something that, that can be, you know, the, the, the first to be relaxed uh, somewhat? So I, so I, think, I think all the measures in Hong Kong have helped, all the measures, but what we want to identify is which ones are the maybe more significant in terms of relaxing and less significant in terms of suppression. So something like school closures, 
I'm sure it's had an effect on COVID, but it also has a real big social community impact because children are at home. We're worried they're not learning. Parents can't go to work if they need to look after their children and so on. So I think school closure is one of the measures that we could look at relaxing earlier because although it has an effect on COVID, it's maybe a smaller effect. We may have to compensate that effect at some point either with reinstituting the closures or by doing other things. But that may be something we can look to relax mm -hmm. sooner. And I know that European countries are, are thinking about the same kind of thing, the same calculations, that school closures are important, but also sending children to school is important for society. And so they're looking to relax those first. And we're going to be looking very carefully at what happens in Europe when schools start again and whether there's any kind of concerning trends. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you so much. And now I'm going to move on uh, to some of the questions that we've been getting through the chat function. Uh, we have one from Joshua Zimmerman here. Um, and he asks, what happens if six months from now you have two worlds, um, places where there have been widespread outbreaks, like the US, like Western Europe, and maybe have some kind of herd immunity, uh, and places like Hong Kong, Vietnam, South Korea, where the virus never actually broke out into the wider population? Uh, what does that mean for rebooting travel and trade? Uh, and what does that mean for the countries where there was actually never any uh, you know, widespread community transmission? So I, I don't know whether that really will play out in that way. But hypothetically, if it did play out in that way, I think places like Hong Kong and Korea would still be very cautious about accepting travelers from those other parts of the world where there might still be infections going on even if they reach a level of herd immunity, it doesn't mean they won't have infections going on. It just means that they won't be concerned about having a large epidemic that would overwhelm their healthcare system because any subsequent epidemics would be of a smaller scale. But I think for those other parts of the world, like maybe the US or Europe, which have had more infections, they might be able to open up their travel and their borders sooner because after you reach a certain level of immunity in the population, you're then less concerned about having more infections coming in because in some sense it wouldn't be so so problematic so so harmful anymore to have a second wave or a third wave it would be like a like a flu season basically at that point mm -hmm. very interesting um and another question here from ken young uh who asks um about mobile phone data uh being used to, to track and identify potential Mm. cases, uh, which has been used in places like Taiwan, Korea, and, and China. I think Singapore, too, has that Bluetooth app, even though it never got sort of widely used. Um, but what, what are your thoughts on that uh, in terms of, of, of mitigation and, and, a, and, and a tool, and whether Hong Kong should start employing uh, some of those uh, kind yeah. of more high-tech uh, tools? So what we've seen in Hong Kong is that isolation is often happening after maybe five, six, seven days. Sometimes it's quicker, but many times it's a little bit delayed. And that means we do need contact tracing to find people who might be uh, already infected but not yet know it. To do contact tracing for someone's family contacts is easy. To do contact tracing for their work colleagues, their social contacts is quite easy. But to have contact tracing for the people that were, were passed at random, maybe standing next to on the bus or, or the train or in a restaurant sitting at another table, that's really difficult. And that's where the mobile phone tracking comes into play. And that's how it's been used in other countries, either in China, where it's just monitored by the government or in places like Singapore, where they're looking to use an app. People voluntarily install it and then the data is provided to the government, but only for the purpose of contact tracing for, for infectious disease control. I think there's still issues with privacy and personal data protection, which are concerns, particularly in Europe, where they're thinking about using these kind of technologies. But they really, it really would be helpful to do that contact tracing for t contacts that it would be otherwise Im impossible or very, very difficult to identify. So I think we need to consider whether that should be used in Hong Kong. As I said in my talk, I think the use of masks in these kind of settings is actually quite helpful. In restaurants, maybe in the future, we'll see restaurants taking people's contact details so that if there was to have been a case in the restaurant, they can help with the contact tracing to find who was sitting at the other tables because that's another location that we know transmission has occurred uh, in different parts of the world. But it's really a difficult issue because of privacy and because of personal data protection. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. Um, so another one here from John Dawson um, who asks, uh, I guess a question that's on everyone's mind always, um, 
how 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 far can you can you trust uh, the numbers coming out of China from your experience? Uh, he notes that Hubei province was the only one that was really severely infected. Obviously, there's one now in, in Harbin, um, but you know it, it, we haven't really seen uh, sort of widespread infections in, in kind of other provinces. So. Uh, how far can we trust those numbers and does it make Hong Kong more vulnerable or should there be more concern, I guess, when, when the borders start easing uh, between the mainland and Hong Kong? I, so certainly they're doing a lot of testing in China, an awful lot of testing. And that's how they've been able to pick up so many asymptomatic cases. Many of those would actually be detected before their symptoms appear. But that shows the aggression in testing people that may have been exposed or may have come from areas where they're suspected to have been cases for example, from overseas. Also, I can tell you that if someone has a positive test for SARS-CoV-2 in China, it will be reported through the system up to the national level. So there's a lot of testing being done and the information on people who test positive will be reported. But what we can't exclude is a possibility that there's some unknown infections in some parts of China, maybe in larger cities, which hasn't reached the level that is picked up because obviously not everybody's tested. People with mild symptoms don't go to the doctor, won't be tested. And so there are opportunities for transmission to begin slowly at first, but then numbers pick up. But I think what we've seen in Harbin is that the Chinese government will respond very, very proactively to any signs of outbreaks. So I don't think we should be too concerned about allowing travel uh, from people to and from mainland China for now, but I think we should keep an eye on it. And I'm, I, I'm aware that we're now testing uh, testing people who come across the border from China if they've been to Hubei province in the past 14 days. But I think that kind of uh, approach could be expanded to people, for example, today from Harbin or who've been to that area or other areas where there are known community cases. That might be a sensible precaution. Mm -hmm. um, and another follow-up question from John Dawson as well. Um, he notes that we're hearing very different reports on, on the timeline for a vaccine. Uh, you know, there's Pfizer uh, saying today that the U.S. will begin testing some vaccines uh, as early as next week. Bill Gates saying it'll take up to 18 months. Uh, you know, what, what timeline do you think is, is most credible here? And, and you know, who, who should we really be, be, be trusting and I guess looking out for to seeing, you know, uh, who's providing the most credible information on this? There's more than 100 different approaches already being tested for COVID vaccines, more than 100 different approaches in different parts of the world. There's a, a process which has to be followed to get a vaccine approved. So there's a series of phases of trials. Phase one is a very, very small trial just to make sure that the vaccine that's being tested isn't harmful. And that's just with a handful of volunteers. And then a phase two study would be a larger number looking at immune responses and whether there's an indication that it might provide protection. And then phase three is the largest type of study, uh, which would have lots and lots of people most likely naturally exposed to COVID and then see whether the vaccine protects them. And there's some suggestions by the Wellcome Trust and other scientists to do volunteer studies for that phase. In other words, to find hundreds or even thousands of people, give them the vaccine and then deliberately expose them to the virus to speed up that kind of trial. But even after those phases have been successfully completed and a vaccine's confirmed to be effective, we'll still then need to make millions or even billions of doses of that vaccine to be used around the world. And that's not a quick process in itself. So even after we've identified a successful vaccine candidate, it still takes time to ramp up the production and then the global distribution and use of that kind of vaccine. So I don't think we could expect to have a vaccinated population within the next year but maybe within the next 18 months we can hope for. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, there's a question here from David Jones. Apologies if I got the, 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 the gist of your question wrong, but I think uh, he's asking, is it possible to compare the number of deaths in Hong Kong from January to April 2020 compared to the same period in 2019? I think he means influenza deaths. I know that um, your team uh, also put out something about the universal mask wearing or near universal mask wearing and how it's dramatically reduced the number of influenza cases here in Hong Kong. But um, I think this question pertains to deaths from influenza. That's right. So I, I think also we can look at excess deaths from COVID. What we've seen in other countries is that there is an increase in deaths from COVID, but there's also sometimes an increase in deaths from other causes like heart attacks and strokes, which may be some of which so let me say again, some of which may be associated with COVID. So even though the person died from a heart attack, 
it wasn't recognized they had COVID, but actually they did. And we'll be able to study that in due course, but it takes time to get access to that information. In Hong Kong, there's a delay before we can access information on mortality statistics. And so we can't do that right now, but as time goes on, we will be able to. And one of the other things we're worried about is because of the disruption to continuity of care, because of, for example, the postponement of elective surgeries for people with cancer, what we're worried about is that in the coming months, there might be increases in cancer mortality, not because of COVID infections, but because of the disruption that COVID has caused on the healthcare system. And that's not so much disruption in Hong Kong, but, but a lot of disruption in other parts of the world where there have been lockdowns. And that's really a, an important secondary effect of, of COVID. Yeah, for sure. Um, so there's a question from uh, Corinne uh, about the um, mechanisms of seasonal flu transmission in Hong Kong and what that might be able to tell us uh, about COVID-19. Um, so, you know, in, in Hong Kong, obviously, is winter season, summer season. Uh, what, what are the causes of surges of seasonal flu? Uh, how does it, how, do, how much does it relate to, to behavior like going back to school, holidays, weather, weather temperature? And what lessons do we have there for the spread of uh, COVID-19 yeah. and how it might be controlled through the seasons and big events? Yeah, but that, that question has been troubling me for years and years, and I still don't have a brilliant answer to that exact question of why in Hong Kong we have these summer surges, because we know flu virus generally prefers cooler and drier weather. But there are some indications that the virus can survive a little bit okay, not as well as in cool and dry, but it can survive okay if it's really hot and humid, or particularly if it's cool, but if it's very humid. And indoors in the summer, the conditions might be acceptable for flu virus to spread. Um, but for COVID, we're not sure if they're the same environmental pressures on transmission. And obviously for flu, because we know children are so important, they're more susceptible to infection, they're more contagious when they do get infected. So a lot of spread is from children in schools and then into their families. And that's how it gets into the community and spreads. For COVID, that's not the case. So there are important differences with COVID transmission and flu transmission. So we, we probably can't say too much about COVID from, from based on the research we've done on flu. Mm -hmm. A uh, question here from Marian Benitez, uh, which uh, follows up a little bit on the vaccine uh, issue. So would you, would you recommend that people in Hong Kong continue wearing masks or some kind of face covering, you know, till vaccines are available? Uh, and, and do you expect that that sort of universal mask wearing will sort of continue, you know, then for the next year or 18 months? Yeah, and I'm aware that we have limited supplies. Many of us don't have a lot of masks, so we're reusing them again and again and again. I've said even from the beginning that I think the most important places to wear masks are in public transport and in crowded areas. In our offices, I think right now there's less need to wear masks and maybe we can save our supplies for when we need them in the future. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that mask wearing is really important and I think we should continue wearing masks through the summer for months to come, particularly though public transport and crowded areas. I don't think we need to wear it all the time, all, the, all day, all the time, but certainly in crowded areas, because as I said before, that's the locations where if transmission was to occur, it could spread quite easily and among people that can't easily be traced and tracked um, because this, we don't know each other when we're on the train, when we're on the bus, on the MTR. And so that's really the locations we wanna prevent transmission from occurring the most. Mm -hmm. Uh, another question from Corinne here, who brings up Singapore's uh, outbreak in, in um, migrant worker dormitories, uh, which are very tightly packed. I've actually done some reporting on this as well, right, which uh, looked at how essentially Singapore authorities weren't as aggressively, you know, testing in those dormitories or, or kind of factoring them into their, to their COVID-19 response. Uh, so related to that, she's asking, is Hong Kong testing in vulnerable communities, like people living in subdivided flats, uh, cage homes, other very, very densely populated kind of living conditions, um, and that could that emerge as a potential weak point for Hong Kong? Uh, if not, what do you think some of Hong Kong's weak points are at, at present, um, you know, especially if we keep the Singapore situation in mind? So I, we're, we're not exactly the same as Singapore because we don't have those large worker dormitories here, but I think there are vulnerable populations in Hong Kong that we need to be very careful about. And I would put elderly homes as one of the most vulnerable locations where often these are in very densely populated parts of the city and it would be very 
easy if there was community infections it'd be easy for infection to get into one of those facilities and then that would be very very uh, harmful to the residents health if infection was to get in i don't think at the moment we need to think about doing testing of people in those kind of vulnerable communities but if we were to see community spread and if we were to see increasing numbers of cases there would certainly be a, a rationale at that point to do more widespread testing even of people who are who are not sick i have a friend works in a, a u.s hospital that focuses on children with cancer and they are now routinely testing all of their staff every week for covid19 so that's a thousand or more staff being tested every single week for COVID because they're so concerned that if a staff member was to bring in infection and they've got a hospital full of children with cancer, it could be really, really nasty and they're really, really careful. And so I can imagine in Hong Kong, in some vulnerable locations, we might start to, to, to have that kind of approach of proactive, regular testing of people. Uh, one more here. I think this is uh, our last question for now. Uh, we have five more minutes left, so if you want to get more in, uh, here's your chance. Um, but a question here from Ricardo Lopez, um, talking about contact tracing. He's asking whether the Australian experience could be instructive. Uh, they had 2.5 million downloads in three days for an app, uh, which is uh, open source and relies on anonymous Bluetooth tracing rather than GPS. Sure. So, but my understanding of these apps with Bluetooth is that on an iPhone, unless you have the app open, the Bluetooth won't work because the iPhone has this security restriction that Bluetooth can't work unless the app is open for those kind of apps. So that's a limitation of the existing apps, particularly for many of us who have iPhones. Um, so I, I don't know the solution to that, but I think Apple are in discussions with those app providers to see if there's a way around it. But there's a reason for that security, uh, sorry, for, for that, for uh, that requirement for security purposes. A mm -hmm. uh, question here from Ralph Cunningham. Uh, this is very Hong Kong based question. Uh, he's asking what are the prospects of mass events, for example, like the Hong Kong sevens in October taking place here this year. I mean, can we just sort of be, are we just sort of bracing ourselves for, for sort of cancellations yeah. of every big I, mass I event? Think, in the I think mass gatherings would be one of the last measures to be relaxed in Hong Kong because there's such a potential for just one infected person to spread to lots and lots of other people in a single event. And that we've seen in other countries, a number of examples of how even relatively smaller mass gatherings have been the sources of large numbers of infections. And so I, I think for something like the Hong Kong sevens, I, I don't think that would be, be able to go ahead uh this year i guess unfortunately because I, I was quite looking forward to it as well <laughs> um great and i do have a question from keith even though he couldn't join us today he sent a question beforehand uh asking you know if you and your team uh have you figure out more details about the origin of, of the virus i'm not sure if that's something you're, you're looking into uh i know there's that the, there has been some consensus right over its origin from the the animal the, the, the market in, in Wuhan, but I don't know if um, you know, you've done more, more research on that. So there's, there's a number of different hypotheses about how the infections first arose. And the, the leading hypothesis, the most likely explanation is that the virus was in a wild animal sold in a market, maybe the Huanan Sifu market, maybe another market in Wuhan, and that somehow the virus had the opportunity to infect a human and then it began to spread from there. Most likely that kind of event would have happened in October or November, not December, because dating of the virus based on its genetic makeup suggests that it really is a little bit older. Most likely the spread from an animal to a human was in October or maybe more likely November. I know that the US government has been talking about the possibility that this is a weaponized virus from the lab in Wuhan that has been working on bat coronaviruses for years and years. There's no evidence that that's the case. The virus does not seem to be artificially modified or engineered in any way. Um, that lab in Wuhan is an expert lab in coronaviruses and has a lot of experience in studying bat coronaviruses, has a large repository of naturally occurring bat coronaviruses, but there's absolutely no evidence that, that this virus was an artificially modified virus that then an artificially modified one that was able to escape from the laboratory. 
Mm-hmm. Right. Just one last question here uh, before we wrap up from Simon Chin. Uh, is it realistically advisable uh, idea to adopt the approach of herd immunity? Is that even workable? Yeah. So if we look at New York, which is New York City, which is comparable in some ways to Hong Kong, I think New York City has 10 million people, if I remember correctly. They've already had 10,000 deaths from COVID uh, in confirmed cases, most likely more deaths than that that haven't been attributed to COVID yet. And the recent study of blood samples, which we're also planning to do in Hong Kong to see how many people might have been infected in New York those studies suggested maybe up to 20% of people have been infected. So that's a long way short of herd immunity. To get herd immunity, you need to go beyond 50% infected. And with 20% of their population infected, they've already had 10,000 deaths. So in Hong Kong, I don't think we would like to go for that approach because if we were to aim for 50% or more of people in Hong Kong being infected, the implication would be that we're also aiming for a lot of people to suffer and die. Uh, and there's no way we would like that to happen. So most likely we will achieve herd immunity in a year or 18 months time after we have a vaccine. And then we can vaccinate everybody and have herd immunity provided by the vaccine. Mm-hmm. Great, well, thank you so much, Professor Carling, for, for taking time uh, today to join us uh, and, and to um, share your thoughts with us. Um, and thank you everyone for signing up for this first uh, online Zoom event all 72 of you. Uh, So thank you so much for that. Um, Really exciting. We hope to do more of these at the club soon. Uh, Thank you so much. Have a good day.